So I, I did walk around uh, the posters outside to see everyone's affiliations and what they're used to. I, I saw a few climate codes, but not too many. Is anybody using NetCDF or parallel NetCDF already? All right, well, <laughs> great. Uh, <laughs> I still think this is a helpful library to start off with because uh, it serves a useful contrast to HDF5. Uh, eight parallel, parallel NetCDF and, and NetCDF are uh, higher level IO libraries that start providing interfaces that make more sense to applications. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> we, talked, we talked a bit about IO hardware. We can't really change the file system. That's part of this, this it comes with the machine and you get what you get. There's, Transformations happening at the IO, at the MPI IO level, there's, and maybe we can do something at the application level here so that the data model that the scientific application is using, uh, we can target that, that data model. So if you are a, a code that's modeling, uh, uh, doing a, a molecular dynamics code like I talked about, uh, those particles, those, those atoms you know, bouncing around, those molecules bouncing around, uh, maybe it's natural to describe them as, as a, a point in space. Or if you're doing a, uh, um, a material, a material a computational fluid dynamics code, uh, you know, your, your cylinder or your vessel is gonna be broken up into 3D physical space, X, Y, Z. And so uh, none of those descriptions talk about offsets into files. Instead, they, talk, they think about arrays or, or some kind of structure that's, that's more sophisticated. And so these libraries, our attempt to uh, bridge that gap and provide something a little more uh, ergonomic. <clears throat> and so what these libraries are trying to do is provide interfaces that, uh, that hide these low-level details and, 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 do, and so high details, provide portability, and provide uh, management for the data. So we, usually that's in the form of, of self-describing file formats where you can come in and, and not know anything about the file and figure out what's in it. Uh, so we're gonna start with one example, parallel net CDF. And so as we, as we established, nobody's using parallel net CDF, but it, it is a, uh, a good contrast to HDF5 because uh, the way that uh, the net CDF and, and parallel net CDF libraries came about was closely tailored to one workload, multidimensional arrays uh, for, for the climate and weather codes. HDF5, by contrast, is much more sophisticated, can, uh, uh, can be applied to a wider array of workloads, and as a result, its interface is a little more uh, complicated in some ways, but because it's complicated because you can do more with it, right? So if you can strip down and just focus on one thing, you're, you can get away with providing a very narrowly tailored interface. Uh, so that we can go through that and compare and contrast the different uh, design points that were made by these two libraries. And then if you're gonna use a library, you can decide which features you need or don't need and, and decide what, what's gonna happen. So um, if you wanna go learn more about Parallel CDF, we have a couple of websites. I should use the pointer. We have a few websites uh, over on uh, MCS and Northwestern, and uh, the hands-on material will also have a couple pointers to where you can learn more about it. Uh, there's a man page for Parallel Net CDF on Theta too. Once you've loaded the Cray Parallel Net CDF module. But okay, so a little, little bit about uh, Parallel Net CDF. It started off as a, an Argon Northwestern project that was going to take the the Unidata serial net CDF and then add a parallel interface to it. We kept the same file format because uh, it, it had a lot of compelling reasons to use to it. It was a self-describing portable file, portable file format. It contained a data, it has a data model that, that relies on multidimensional arrays of type data. So, you know, a floating point array that's X by Y by Z big. You can put annotations on the data set, the variable, the dimensions, so you can describe to other users what's going on in there. And then the usual um, bindings of different languages. Parallel net CDF adds the notion of non-contiguous I.O. because we're working in MPI context. And also the idea of collective I.O., which we were able to use in a pretty good effect here. And then a non-blocking I.O. interface. I'll talk a little bit about that if time permits. 
Then uh, a couple years after we started working on parallel NetCDF, the uh, NetCDF 4 project came along, which added parallel uh, interfaces to Unidata NetCDF. So this is a uh, unfortunate bit of confusion here. We have uh, parallel NetCDF or PNetCDF, that's the Argonne Northwestern one. And then we have uh, Unidata's parallel uh, NetCDF. Yeah, sorry, uh, there's a bit of a confusion there. But um, we try to use the term PNetCDF for our stuff, or um, we might, I, might, I might call it Unidata NetCDF or NetCDF4 for the other one. Uh, at this point, the two interfaces are a little bit different, but the file formats are the same, unless you're using uh, the HDF5 backend for NetCDF4. Uh, this gets complicated, uh, sorry. Yeah, talk about that. So what goes on in the data model? Uh, this is, I mentioned this, but we'll talk about it again because it's important. The scientist thinks in terms of multidimensional cubes or, or patches, right? A climate code would look at pressure over a patch of North America or a chunk of atmosphere. And this is the kind of science that's going on. I wanna, I wanna see how heat exchange flows across this front of, of the weather. I don't, as a scientist, care about the offset in the file, but that's all tucked away inside parallel net CDF. There's a small header, or maybe it's big if it pads out to a banner, but there's a header that says what's gonna be in the file. I've got these variables, they're gonna have these dimensions, and some of these things are exposed to the user through um, like the name of the dimensions, the types that are there, and some of these information like the starting offset is, is tucked away and, and hidden. Uh, once, and so after the header, then there's a, a, a region of, of data. So the nice thing about, from, from an implementer, implement, implementer standpoint, the nice thing about NetCDF data, the NetCDF format is that once you've described the data, it's sort of fixed. So we can, we can have all the variable data can be for, for one, all the data for one variable can be in one region of the file and then so on and so on and so on. There is a, there's a record variable in, in uh, NetCDF and parallel NetCDF. Record variables are what you might use if you have something growing over time. So a sensor out in, the, in a prairie that's recording temperature and wind speed would be writing out to a, a NetCDF data set and then the unlimited dimension would be a record variable. And the way record variables are implemented is you have the fixed dimension, the, the you know, maybe X and Y and, and latitude, longitude and, and altitude, and then time might be the unlimited dimension. And so if you have five record variables in, in your NetCDF data set, you're gonna have the, all the data interleaved like a deck of cards, where the first time step for all five variables is gonna be in the file, and then the second time step in the file, and the third time step. When we implemented this, this is, this is my sadness as a, as a clever parallel I.O. person, we said, ah, we'll just tell people not to use record variables because they perform poorly and no one will use them. Everybody uses them. It is, so, uh, our bad. Uh, it, we'll, you'll see, the, the, so there's a, there are extra steps you can do to get good performance out of record variables, but this is a case where the design of the file system has a direct impact on performance you can get. Uh, so the reason why the, the parallel net CDF file format is, is so um, easy to implement is because it, it puts a burden on the user. There's a, a bimodal interface where you have to pre-declare all your I.O. You've, you, when you create a NetCDF or parallel NetCDF data set, you say, hey, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna write 10 variables. Those variables have the following dimensions and the following data types. And I'm gonna put these attributes on the file and I'm gonna do all this stuff and then that's, that exits the find mode. Now you're in data mode and you start doing the I.O. And that's a bit of a pain, doing the pre-declaring of all the I.O. But as a result, if you pay that price, every I.O. call knows exactly where to go in the file. Uh, there's no need to look up anything or consult with anybody. Everybody knows what's gonna happen and they can, they can then compute exactly where to write and that greatly reduces the amount of uh, description that's gonna happen. And so, uh, so I mentioned that because this, this is a pretty useful pattern in parallel programming if you can uh, decouple your description of what's gonna happen with the execution of what happens, there's a chance for the implementation to do a lot of clever things with that separation. Uh, we see the same thing with, with uh, non-blocking sends and receives, right? If you, 
there's no guarantee when progress happens for non-blocking sends and receives. So you post <clears throat> a thousand non-blocking sends and receives to the MPI library. Maybe those are, are coalesced in some way or they're optimized or massaged in some way. Uh, there's a chance for the library to do some work for, on your behalf. All right. Excuse me. So let's take a look at what the analogous sort of multi you know, array of writes will look like in parallel at CDF. I will, uh, for the sake of time, I don't want to ask you to go ahead and do this, but if you wanted to write it out, go, ahead, go, ahead, go nuts. Uh, so we start off in define mode. Right? Your first part of the code is going to describe uh, how many rows and element, you know, some, some what do you call this, a, uh, this is, these are the dimensions. So the interface looks like this, right? There's a prefix ncmpi, that's, that's our namespace. Uh, there's a def, um, you, you'll find also puts and inquiries. So we're, we are creating a description of what's going on in the file. And now we're describing dimensions. Those dimensions have names and, and then there's an identifier that we'll associate with variables later. So here we have, um, yeah, so how, big, how, many row, how many rows are we dealing with here? How, how, big are the, how many elements are in each row? Okay. In this case, uh, every, uh, every process was gonna write some number of, of rows out to the file. So, so globally, we're describing how big the, the X and Y is, is gonna look like. All right, and then we associate with this, uh, these, this, this dims array, here's dims over here. We associate that with uh, a, a variable called array. Yeah, very clever name, I guess. Uh, but then we have, so we have those identifiers. We're, we're, we're building up the description. And then we can put an attribute on, uh, in this case, we're putting it on the var ID array. So we're, these attributes can go on dimensions, on the file itself. Uh, but in this case, we're gonna associate this, this human readable, sorry, this, this metadata with the variable ID. All right, and so now, uh, instead of doing subarrays and dealing with data types and, and when things are, are valid or not, we can just set up the starts and counts. And so, again, these are like, we're, we're thinking in terms of arrays. So what is, we know how big the overall array is because we described uh, the variable up here. And, oh, sorry, uh, before we do that, before we, we, we put any uh, variable data, we have to switch from, from define mode to data mode. And then, uh, yeah, so starting offset, it's gonna be the, uh, you know, based on my rank, where I am in, the, which, which, which uh, which column I'm gonna be in, and then I'm gonna write out, you know, count data. It's gonna be uh, an, a, a, a Y by X patch of the array. Okay, great, so we've done that. We're, we've, we're writing out the array, we're doing it collectively. This is a chance for the library to do a lot of stuff on our behalf. All right. So underneath parallel CDF, right, we, we, we haven't seen any, we haven't seen any MPI calls here. Uh, I, I guess I've omitted in this, these fragments the actual MPI calls that happen inside the examples. There's an MPI init that happens, MPI finalize, and, and when you open the file, you pass an MPI communicator in. That's about as much of MPI that leaks through to parallel CDF as, as we have. Under the hood, MPI file open is gonna use that communicator to collectively open the file. Maybe there's gonna be some tuning hints, but don't worry about that. And because every process is describing the header, there's a, you can keep a cache of it locally, and then once we do the, the write of the header to the file, we don't have to worry about updating it anymore or keeping any updates in, or, or propagating any updates in any processes. All right, and then once we end define mode with, with ncmpi and def, we can uh, broadcast that header and, and make sure everybody has the same story, uh, same picture of what's going to happen, what's going to happen. We've ended, we've, when we end define mode, we're in data mode now. Uh, we're using collective IO, and as we saw with our earlier example, uh, while we are talking about arrays, we're gonna build MPI data types underneath, and we'll use collective IO to, to do the IO. Uh, there's an old tool called JumpShot, uh, which I love, but it, it, it's, uh, there are other ways to do, get this kind of information, but this is a, a timeline view of what's happening in this simple uh, parallel NetCF using application. This is a, a flash IO checkpoint Flash is a, is a adaptive mesh refinement code and it's, it writes its adaptive mesh code into parallel net, net, parallel net CDF structures, which don't directly map to uh, multidimensional arrays. <clears throat> so you'll see some weird artifacts in this picture. So okay, 
each row of these is a MPI process. And then time goes left to right, you know, beginning of time over here somewhere and the end of time. Well, I guess beginning of time is here. Uh, no, 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 okay, so this, is, this is the third checkpoint file. So a, few time, a, few, a bit of time has passed, but we're over here looking at this file. We have opened the file. So in JumpShot, all of the MPI routines get, get captured and logged and, and displayed in some, in some fun color. I could have gone a further step in, and logged the parallel NetCDF routines, but because the gap, the, the distance between what parallel NetCDF does and what MPI does, MPI IO does is so small, I don't think you really see a whole lot of information, interesting information. But I do wanna, uh, so we, but I can, we can, we, so every MPI call here maps directly to a parallel NetCF call. Parallel NetCF call, basically. All right, so <clears throat> up here in this tiny little gray block, that's an independent write of the, of the header. And you can see uh, it's pretty small here. I just one process wrote it out. Then there are, there's a, a little bit of some very, very small write rates here. I think 10 small collective writes. And what's going on here is the uh, adaptive mesh structure, the, the parent-child relationships, which nodes are leaf nodes and internal nodes, all that's been in, 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 canonicalized into some uh, array structure and then written out to the NetCDF file. Following that, there are, uh, there are four variables being written collectively. And some processes are what we call the IO aggregators. The MPI IO aggregators are spending a lot of time writing the data out. Other processes are, are not participating in the I.O. in that way. They are just uh, contributing their data and then waiting for the aggregators to finish. So on this machine, every fourth process was an I.O. aggregator. And then when the file closes, sometimes you gotta hang out and wait a bit for the process, for the I.O. aggregator to finish. But uh, I just like to show this because there's, there's a bunch of stuff going on inside uh, the library and maybe we can't always see it directly. But uh, you know, at the at the MP, at the parallel NetCDF layer, we didn't know about I/O aggregators. We didn't know about uh, um, the independent I/O happening. But that's all going on here on our behalf. And if you were to write a simple example and, and look at the Darshan log, you might see uh, a bit of the NetCDF behavior. Uh, Darshan will log that parallel NetCDF was called, but not too much detail about what's going on with parallel NetCDF. So you, you can see that we opened a parallel, we can open a NetCDF file, but you won't see that you made 10 put vera calls. Uh, we just uh, haven't had a lot of call for that yet. Uh, and again, because we can, we can infer what's happening from the MPI IO calls. But you will see MPI IO and POSIX calls like you would with the other cases. Oh, yeah. May I ask a question about the previous slide? Great. Uh, this slide? Yeah. Uh, why are a couple of them taking so long to close their files? To close the file, uh, close is a collective operation, and so the pro so the question was, everything's going on fine here, but the, the close for some processes is taking a few seconds, uh, and this is an, this is something you'll see in in, in in many cases with collective calls and MPI. Uh, if there is a uh, a workload imbalance, and some processes enter the collective sooner than others, they can't finish the collective until everybody enters the collective. So uh, I'm not sure exactly, it doesn't exactly match with what's happening here, but there is a, a step in the close process that can't happen until the, the, the slow processes get a little bit further in their, in their job. So there's a, a um, some people call it a pseudo synchronization step in, in collective calls where, uh, you know, the, I, I honestly don't remember what the, what the process is waiting for, but in this collective call, this rank is waiting for some information from the, the IO aggregators and not getting it until those processes get a little further along. So that, that imbalance can be a, a drawback to collective IO if you have irregular workloads, um, maybe you're traversing a mesh or a graph. If you're traversing a graph and trying to route the leaf nodes, right, that might not be a good fit for collective I.O. Uh, if you have highly irregular workloads and some processes end up with tons of data and some processes don't, again, that might not be a good fit either. So something to keep in mind. Any more questions? 
Great. So, as, in terms of uh, when you do the collective rights, um, is there a command to do like a flushing process because you don't want something to hang? So the question was, if you want to sort of ensure everyone is on the same track and has been, has reached that that collective, is there a call you can make? And uh, there really isn't, uh, oddly. You can do an MPI barrier, and that will make sure everybody reached the barrier call, but there's no guarantee about when processes leave the barrier. I mean, it probably won't be five minutes, right? It'll probably be pretty close. And so, you know, a, a, a barrier call might, might help mitigate that a little but bit. But if you had like a buffer and you need to uh, yeah. flush the... There are, um, the MPI IO library has an MPI file sync call, and that will flush some things, but, but in the way that we've implemented it, it won't do much to uh, get all the processes on the same page. Uh, what, would, what would be a, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's a great solution to that right now. Yeah, but it's good insight, thanks for asking. All right, more questions before I go to reading? Okay. So I like to talk about this application. Hmm. Right, before I get to reading, I want to talk a little bit about, I, talk a little, I want to talk a little bit about how real science might use a NetCDF or parallel NetCDF data set. So uh, one example is this cosmology code called hack. Uh, and now they, um, they don't use parallel NetCDF in production, but they, we did evaluate what, what it would take to, to use parallel NetCDF for this code. And I think it's a fun science problem. Uh, Katrin, Heitman, who, who works on, on Hack, is giving a dinner talk tonight, and so I'm looking forward to hearing about her, uh, her war stories here. They, um, it's a really big simulation. It's some, like, I don't know how many trillions of particles there are. But what they're doing is they're, they're modeling the universe. They're literally modeling the entire universe on these supercomputers, right, from, from Planck time of the Big Bang to, to right now. And how do you know you're right? Well, we have sky surveys that are collecting hundreds of terabytes of data. Sorry, tons of data of the sky of how it looks right now. In this simulation, you start off with your billion or trillion particles, and then you apply your understanding of of space, of, 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 of uh, interplanetary physics and, and astrophysics, and see if you get the right answer. Uh, do you get galaxies forming and, and black holes and all these other things? And that just blows my mind that we can do that. But yeah, apparently with enough supercomputing power, we can get pretty close. Uh, and so, right, if you, if you see something that looks like the night sky, you can say your understanding or your model of um, interplanetary and astrophysics is pretty close, right? So, billions of particles, trillions of particles, all modeled with various data structures. Uh, and again, because they're running very aggressively on these machines, they, they often run into errors, they're going to checkpoint the data for defensive purposes, but they also want to be able to visualize the data and, and say what they've found in their experiments. <clears throat> so if you were to, to map that to parallel net CDF, you might do a few things. You might create a giant table of particles. Here was the first problem in parallel, in parallel net CDF. We couldn't identify, we couldn't, we didn't uh, have support for uh, three trillion particles. So it was, you know, whatever the limit of you know, two to 32 is, uh, so we had to make that bigger, right? So instead of, um, there, was a, there were some limits that we had to expand a bit. Uh, right, we have a list of all the particles, and there's a, there's a, there's a, a location in space, there's a velocity in each of the x, y, and z vectors, and then some kind of physical quantity, phi, I don't know exactly what that does, but we're keeping track of all that for every particle. There's gonna be a little bit of a scratch space where we say something about what our experiment is trying to do, what is this model, what, what you know, this, this, campaign was trying to accomplish X and Y and, and what we are here. And then this index is where we talk about the, the block boundaries for each process. You know, block 45 is gonna have a, a, a bound of so, bi so big and, and it has these particles, a starting index and an end index into this particle table. Uh, so again, parallel net CDF isn't really a particle library, but with a little bit of work, they could map it into multidimensional arrays. And so, um, you know, pull out the code from their, their I.O. kernel and, and NCMPI create is the call to, to look at the file. We use this extra, this new file format to, to accommodate their, their many number of particles. 
and we're using a communicator that describes how many processes are involved here. <coughs> uh, we put a, an attribute on the file. On, uh, NC global is the entire data set that's describing how, you know, oops, sorry. Uh, that's going to annotate the entire data set uh, with a, you know, some kind of information. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's anything. And then here's the type data here. We're going to put uh, a floating point attribute, um, the minimum attribute of something here. So that helps the analysis codes get started. Right? Or whatever, I don't know. I'm not, not a hack person, but these are the kind of things you're doing with the library. Uh, other, so other things here. This is, again, uh, more of the define mode, talking about the different variables. And uh, again, making sure you put your units on here, right? We lost the Mars lander because someone was doing Imperial and someone was doing metric units, so it's important. Uh, uh, then data mode, right? It's gonna look, uh, this is, this is a, a particle code, so maybe, you'll, maybe if you're doing some kind of particle simulation, you might use this trick. Uh, the MPI X scan routine goes through and it, and it collectively figures out, you know, what is the, in this case, uh, you know, sum. Uh, so if I'm, I'm rank zero, right? Uh, the answer is my particles, and then rank one is rank zero's number of particles plus my particles, and then rank two is the previous two processes plus, and, and so on and so forth. Going through the process, so the answer would be as if rank zero started off and saying, hey, my answer is five, and then rank one said, my answer is five plus six, and then one said, my answer is 11 plus seven, and, and so on and so forth. And at the end of this collective call, everybody knows where everybody else is gonna be in this, well, everybody knows where they are relative to everybody else, so we can figure out an offset, this is the, in the end, the answer is where to start in the particle table. And then we can, uh, so with that, um, that variable identifier and then a start and a count, we can collectively write to that file. These scientific data sets are not useful if you can't query the data and figure out what's going on. So uh, we have a couple examples of how you might uh, interrogate the file. You can start from clean slate and not know anything about the file and then start figuring out things like, okay, well, you, you, this, this file has, has n variables and six dimensions and, and so on and so forth, and you can then keep querying and, and figure out what's going on. Often, in your domain, you'll have what's called conventions, and so you'll know that code produced in this code has this, has this you know, this, the convention version six, and so you don't have to do a full uh, clean slate query, you can just, you know there's gonna be 10 variables in this file, and if you don't have 10 variables, it's an error and something bad happened. And so uh, uh, that might be a shortcut you might have in your domain. But you know, if you do enough packing and omit error checking, you can squeeze it all into one slide of C code. So let me walk through the highlights here. NCMPI inc, so underscore inq is the inquiry routines. That's how you figure out um, what's in the file. In this case, we're figuring out everything about the file. How many dimensions, how many variables, how many global attributes, and is there, are there gonna be any record variables in the file? And if you, know those, if you know that information, then you can start allocating memory to do more things. Okay, well, I have this many dimensions, so let's go figure out what the dimensions are. I'm gonna inquire about the dimension length and uh, each of these dimensions in the file can be associated with multiple variables. So uh, we keep track of the sizes in, these, in this size array. And then, <clears throat> all right, so now we, we know how many, uh, right, we know how many variables are in the file because we, we queried up here in step one. And so we can go through and we can inq underscore var and we can say, okay, uh, okay, right. Another thing about parallel net CDF is uh, all the variables, all the dimensions, they start with an index of zero and they stop at the, the number that's given. So we, can, we don't have to worry about finding what the, you can imagine a modern version of this might use a C++ iterator, right? And, and then you wouldn't have to worry about what the indexes are, but this is, this, this is a, an older C approach where you just start from zero and, and go to some limit. Uh, so here, we, we're querying each variable to figure out how big it is, how many um, attributes it might have and then we can close the file. We didn't do anything with, it was, we didn't do anything with this information, uh, but we can figure out the structure of the file. Uh, other thing I wanna point out is in this query code, we didn't actually, we didn't have to switch between define mode and data mode because we were able to uh, go with what we, we already knew uh, enough about, sorry. We're not changing the data set. 
we're just looking at what's in there already. So there's no need to um, do that to define mode, data mode switch. Yes? So the standard printf knows to work with the file that was opened with the netcdf library open? Uh, so, in the, so the question was about the C call to printf. Uh, printf is just going to dump out to the console some information. So I was just not doing anything useful with it. I was just showing something, uh, proving that it actually did some work. You're right. Um, a real code wouldn't actually have that. Uh, so if we were going to take our examples and, and read, uh, here's how we might do that, right? We have the same notional multidimensional array, and we're going to use a couple of routines. We're going to we're going to figure out how big the dimensions are in the file. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to figure out how far along in our simulation this was from. And then we're going to, to uh, collectively read that column of data out of the array. All right, so highlights. Uh, I should start on this. I'll stand on this for a second for change. All right, so highlighting the file. We have, <clears throat> we're, we're, in court, we're, we're looking at the file. We're going to say, okay, we have, uh, we, we we know we have a couple variables in the file. We know we have at least one variable in the file. So we'll just skip all the, the ab initio uh, queries and we'll, we'll go with the convention approach. But we're gonna query the variable, how big is the variable, and, uh, and so we, we know, so yeah, query the variable, we know it has, we're gonna find out from this answer it has two dimensions and then we'll get the two uh, dimension sizes. And then we can get an attribute on the variable, okay, it's iteration whatever, will be stored in this variable, and now, Again, we can index into the file just like we did for the writes with a, a count into the global uh, name, the globals, uh, the logically the logically global array, and then the starting offset, and then we're collectively reading it, and that should give a chance for the MPI library. I would imagine the MPI library would have one process read and broadcast the answer to everybody else. Uh, then <clears throat> well, we talked. To, okay. Any questions about, about reading it and querying and, and interrogating, interrogating these files? All right. So here's an, here's a, an optimization we add to parallel NetCDF that is uh, not, not in uh, Unidata's NetCDF, but we found to be really useful in many cases. And we had a, a non-blocking interface in a parallel NetCDF, looks a lot like MPIs, we put an I in the, in the name, so we know it's not gonna, it's gonna complete immediately, but you complete separately. So you, you post two operations and then you wait for completion. And while we call it non-blocking, uh, that's not to be confused with asynchronous progress. All the work happens in wait all. It's just that uh, we've given a description with these two calls and then wait all can put them together and then do a single IO operation to the storage. And there's a couple chance, why would you do that? Well, uh, if you have fewer calls to the library, you're giving more information, you can get, uh, you can have less synchronization and, and better optimizations. And that looks like this with our friends in the Flash code. I should have done this earlier. Flash is modeling supernovas. They're exploding uh, up in space all the time. And they're great for understanding how far away the world is because they have this thing called standard candle. And they uh, are really fascinating hydrodynamics codes. But our friends at the Flash group are trying to uh, do a couple things. They want to run on really big machines right away. They want to have, uh, they want to visualize that, that data somewhere else. And so they have the, they, they'll use standard files like HDF5 or Parallel CDF. And again, it, it's a adaptive mesh code, but they're going to take some steps to convention, to canonicalize that data into the multidimensional arrays that we're, that we can, we can handle in these libraries. The other thing to point out is there's these ghost cells in Flash, they're, they're just great for um, nearest neighbor communication. You, you cache some data and you can skip some communication that way, but you don't want to write that out. So the, the data structure that's being passed to these libraries is a little more complicated than just a big chunk of memory. All right. So if we use the right combining optimization in Flash, uh, we can get a pretty big jump in performance. This is, uh, what is this, like writing out 10 variables out to a checkpoint file and we can, we can get perform a pretty big jump in performance because, uh, <clears throat> sorry, we could do two different ways. The full story is like this. The Flash guys came to us and said, look, we're getting pretty bad performance, what can we do? And we said, well, if you, uh, instead of writing out 27 variables, if you had a, instead of writing 27 4D variables, if you made a fifth dimension that was the variable identifier, 
and wrote all those 27 variables in, in terms of a, a big array, then you could get, you could get better performance. Uh, and they said, well, that's great. And they ran the experiment and it did. But again, all things happen in a, in a collaboration. The checkpoint code could get better performance, but their uh, visualization and analysis collaborators would have to update their tools and they would have to change file formats across the board for all these different, this whole ecosystem, right? And so that would be a, they would do that. They're on version 14 or something now, but that's a change they don't want to make arbitrarily. So instead of changing the file format, we could use this non-blocking interface, get the same jump in performance and maintain the file, um, the file layout. So, you know, I've got an example a skeleton in the codes. You can try this out. Uh, and, uh, right, uh, so you can try out the right combining on your own and see what happens, what doesn't happen. Uh, a couple things to point out, right? Uh, we'll have multiple arrays here, because you, you, know, you could also do operation, this optimization could also work on multiple IOs to the same array, but uh, doesn't have to be the same array. Uh, and then, right. Uh, I put is the interface, right? Uh, Non-blocking puts. We give the same uh, data types and, and descriptions. Oh, uh, var a is the net CDF way of saying subarray access. There's a, a bunch of different ways of doing array access, but uh, var a is one of the more common ones for our for our purposes. You give a, a start and account at, uh, accessing data in the in the array, and then all the I/O happens in this final step where we say, look, there's two requests. Please. Do all that I/O and, and tell me what happens. Uh, when I ran this example uh, a year ago, it was it, it didn't actually result in any combining of oper operations. Uh, it looked like it was two separate MPI I/O calls, and uh, I hadn't yet investigated what's going on inside the library and what that is. Um, performance was was. See, the thing is, it was a very small example, so I'm, I'm wondering if maybe because I was using a toy amount of data certain optimizations didn't kick in, right? So that there's, um, I should probably try this again with, with megabytes of data and see what happens. Something for you to experiment. All right, so we covered a lot about parallel CDF. Uh, again, not super important if you go off and, and write parallel CDF code, but uh, it's, a, it's a good first step towards thinking about uh, IO, IO models and, and data model libraries because uh, it only provides one kind of access, multidimensional arrays. But even, even with that simple data model, we're adding collective I.O., uh, data type I.O., and non-blocking I.O. And it, it might take a little bit of work to get into that multidimensional uh, size. Maybe, maybe too much work, right? If you're doing certain, um, if you have certain uh, irregular structures, it may not be a good fit at all. Uh, for a while, we had some, some limitations, but we worked hard to, to, re to, relieve, to release, uh, relax those limitations and contribute those back to Unidata's NetCDF format. So uh, at this point, uh, Unidata's NetCDF and, and Parallel CDF are completely compatible back and forth uh, in terms of file formats. Uh, we had a, a fun exchange, I have a little bit of time, so I'll talk about this, uh, where there's a part in the spec that said you could, do, you could do this thing, you could pad out variables if you wanted to. So great, we padded our, our variables out to, to block alignment, and then that broke uh, all the Unidata code because they didn't expect people to do that. And so it was a case where we were more, we were closer to the spec than they were and, and they quickly fixed the problem. And uh, it's the kind of thing that happens when you publish a spec and other people use it, right? You make some assumptions and then your users see it and like, oh, okay, I better do that differently. Um, so later on today, uh, after lunch, Quincy will talk about some of these, about HDF5, but there are a bunch of uh, high level IO libraries out there. Uh, a lot of these are closely tailored to a specific application domain, right? So uh, H5 part in particular is a good example. The 400 or something elements, uh, items in the HDF5 API are boiled down to five. And so if you're doing a uh, particle accelerator, you, you might you know, use H5 part and you're gonna track these particles and, and everything you need is in this, this you know, small number of routines. Uh, sometimes like with PIO and, and GIO, they are their own abstraction layers. So uh, again, application scientists, they want to get their job done. And on some machines, MPI IO is really good and some machines is really bad. And so uh, they stick with this 
parallel I.O. abstraction layer, and then underneath they might do parallel net CDF or serial net CDF or, or whatever. They've got five or six different approaches. Uh, and, and these guys, the PIO guys, and I keep going back and forth about whether they should be doing optimizations at their level or push that off to the MPI I.O. level. And sometimes I'm right, and sometimes they're right, and it's been a fun uh, collaboration over the years. Uh, we talked about, we mentioned adios briefly, uh, some of the questions here. Uh, again, uh, in some domains, used quite a bit. Uh, Oak Ridge folks put a lot of work into making sure that's gonna be a good experience for people. So if you're running on, uh, if, you, if you were running on Titan or you're gonna run on Summit, you can probably find somebody who can get your adios code smoking fast. Um, yeah, and so with that, I'm all done with, with my part of uh, the day. So any questions before we go to lunch? All right. Well, uh, I'm around all day and all night, and hopefully I'll talk to some of you some more later. <laughs>